Oi! Wonderful electronic invention I want you to see. It, it looks something like this. Bitcoin. 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 Ethereum and Litecoin. The stellar coin. Ripple. Bitcoin alert. Over the last few years, the only thing more impressive than the skyrocketing surge in cryptocurrency prices is the media attention they've attracted. But what if, in this tsunami of media coverage of digital currencies, we're missing the big story? What if the real revolution isn't the short-term surge in the valuation of these coins, but in the business applications of blockchain, the technology that powers cryptocurrency? My name is Ash Bennington. I'm going to talk to entrepreneurs, consultants, and theorists to find out what's happening in the world of business blockchain. I'm in Midtown Manhattan, heading to Hudson Malone to meet with my old colleague, Forbes crypto staff writer Michael Del Castillo to discuss the issues and to put my conversation with the other experts into context. The words enterprise blockchain, what do they mean to you? To me, enterprise blockchain is the adoption of um, this distributed ledger technology that was first popularized by Bitcoin by companies that are already generating revenue using the old centralized model. Michael and I met when we were both reporters at Coindesk. While I was finance and markets lead, Michael was delving into exactly these issues running corporate blockchain coverage. In a lot of ways, the distributed ledger technology behind Bitcoin was designed to make middlemen unnecessary. And when we talk about enterprise adoption of this very same technology, sometimes it's, it's actually those very same middlemen that some people are imagining no longer need to exist. So striking that balance um, between staying on the cutting edge of what technology enables while still holding on to a strong revenue stream is really at the core of what makes enterprise adoption of blockchain so interesting. So what exactly is a blockchain? A blockchain is a distributed database that stores information in blocks, which you can think of as a kind of virtual container for data. As new data gets added, additional blocks are created. The blocks are then linked together chronologically to form a sequence of blocks called a chain. As new information gets added, the chains get longer. This method of data storage is called non-destructive, meaning old data never gets erased or overwritten because the previous blocks in the chain remain unchanged. Each new block that is written contains something called a cryptographic hash, a small mathematical fingerprint of the blocks that came before it in the chain, making it extremely difficult to tamper with the data that resides inside the blocks. We spoke to some very interesting people in this space, people mm -hmm. at top consulting firms, people at sort of hipster Brooklyn startups across the board. This is going to be really interesting to get your view on what they're thinking about this. First, we went downtown to IBM's Watson Global Headquarters and spoke to Jason Kelly, general manager for IBM's blockchain services. When you think of core value, it's back to what's the core outcome. And blockchain really is as bright and shiny and exciting as it is, it, it's really simple. It reaches two elusive objectives that have been there for years. First, we know that businesses and the outcome of businesses run on data. There's been two things we've always tried to get with data. First, access, shared and permissioned access. The other is that once you get to that data, is that data quality there? Is it what you think it is? Are you sure? Those two things are now the biggest outcomes that you have with this bright, shiny technology. One of the things that makes blockchain so powerful is its distributed nature. Distributed, in this case, means that data isn't just stored in one centralized database controlled by a single account or administrator, but across a wide-ranging network of computers called nodes. In fact, the capacity for global networking itself is at the very core of how blockchain works. Modern distributed computer networks began in the late 1960s with ARPANET, a precursor of the modern internet, which connected computers at research universities out west. But peer-to-peer -peer networks, which power blockchain's communication and are so central to its functionality, are a much more recent invention. The first well-known peer-to-peer network was Napster, which arrived in the late 1990s. Napster, as you probably remember, allowed users to share music files between their personal computers. Each node, or independent computer on the network, has the ability to share data with all of the others without being coordinated by a central computer. Really, the value that you get in this transparency and trust, in this, this thought that you have transactions that are happening across different stages with people, paper, and process. Well, if you think of that, people tend to go, supply chain, 
And it's an, it's an easy one because you have these transactions that go from point A to Z, or in some cases, this thought of farm to fork. There's many people who consume organic food. However, there's more organic food consumed than is produced. Wouldn't it be great if you could confirm right there before you consume or at point of purchase that this is organic? You know, food, as soon as you say, oh, there could be an illness, that food is presumed guilty until it's proven innocent. So you're gonna throw it away. So working with Walmart, who is world-class, world-class, seven days in finding the point of origin of their food, you'd say, seven days, that's a lot of food to be throwing away. How can we take IBM Food Trust and use this blockchain network and figure this out? And in doing that, they went from seven days, world-class, to 2.2 seconds. Trust is going to be part of each transaction. IBM has been far and away one of the earliest enterprise blockchain adopters in the world. But then something really interesting happened in November of 2017, uh, which is that IBM became the first global enterprise to publicly talk about uh, embracing uh, cryptocurrency in a real application. Slowly, we've seen this shift where enterprises uh, who are in a lot of ways, the, the, the definition of these middlemen are, right. are, are experimenting with the technology. It's industry. almost like as though they've gotten to the point where they decide if someone's going to intermediate them, they might as well intermediate, just intermediate themselves, right? Well, that ties in very nicely to the point that they were making, that it's about transparency and trust. How do they do that, though? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. When we see enterprises um, looking at using blockchain technology, um, we're not actually talking about self-disintermediation. We're not talking mm. about... Uh, a, a sort of a Trojan horse that, that makes the company unnecessary. What we're talking about is increased efficiency at the middle and the back office level. That must uh, still be frightening for enterprises to even have that conversation, right? I'll tell you I who I think it's frightening for are the employees. For now, um, what enterprise blockchain adoption looks like is really reimagining middle and back office operations with fewer um, employees to help make it happen. Then we went uptown to Park Avenue to KPMG's U.S. headquarters and spoke to Eamon McGuire, Managing Director, Advisory at KPMG. How is the mortgage industry structured today? And specifically, if you could touch on some of the pain points. Yeah, so the mortgage industry is incredibly complex. It's one of the most diverse ecosystems that I can think of. There are multiple providers who are involved in making a mortgage happen. So for a customer, it's a pretty awful process. Uh, it takes somewhere between 60 and 90 days in the United States to get a mortgage. What is it about this technology that's so unique? The data aspect of blockchain, as well as the smart contract aspect of blockchain, which is about executing automated processes, are the two things that make blockchain be particularly useful or good for people. In the future, uh, if you were to go to a portal and choose a product, you could effectively provide for digital power of attorney to the lending institution to go and get all of the information about you hmm. uh, without having to lift a finger beyond providing that uh, digital power of attorney. So you could authorize the banking institution to collect information on your employment, on your alimony payments, um, on the value of the current asset or assets that you have, on your credit score, on so many things that have historically been very, very painful for the borrower to provide. And now it can all happen at the drop of a hat. And there's no doubt that there could be situations where some of the process might be, let's say, accelerated or expedited. Like, for example, in the title search space, uh, many times when a title search is done, a title search is done not just on the most recent um, owner for the property, but you may need to go back in history many generations and many owners ago to confirm the validity of the provenance and ownership for the current property. In a blockchain world where there is confidence in the historical information that has been collected on the ownership for the property, then you will only have to go to one generation and to update the historical record. When you take a look at the accounting industry, uh, they, they, they really were the second adopter of enterprise blockchain technology. Obviously, the first um, use case was cross-border payments with Bitcoin and uh, buying and selling alpaca socks. But the second use case was really accounting. 
Uh, and, and I remember the, the first time that I put the words big four accounting firm in a headline, people were freaking out because the idea of a, of a big four accounting firm using this technology that we had only used to buy alpaca socks before was, right. was mind boggling. But uh, the, the, the connection from a decentralized way to send money to a decentralized way to account for money is, is so close as to be inseparable. And I, I think it was, it was really inevitable right. that accounting firms were gonna be the, 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 the next to experiment. I just actually purchased my first home and I, I can't tell you how frequently I wished that the people that I was dealing with had access to the same <laughs> ledger. It right. was just time and time right. and time again. Uh, week after 10 months of work, um, a week before closing, we discovered we were missing a certificate that mm. the previous three owners hadn't had. And, and this is exactly the case for that ledger that can go back and see what's been in the process. Yeah, by example. moving certificate of occupancies to a distributed ledger, um, and, and so that every time uh, an upgrade is made to a property, that certificate is passed down to the next owner without any extra work right. is um, incredibly, incredibly valuable. Next, we went out to Bushwick, Brooklyn, to meet with Jesse Grushak, co-founder of Ujo Music, which works under the umbrella of the blockchain giant Consensus. What we're doing and what we have been kind of working on for the past few years is building a new music industry. A lot of the laws and rules and regulations were set when we were still listening to piano rolls, and the world's changed quite a bit since then. And so now, you know, there's no system built for digital music. There's no systems that can handle the transfer of files and value transfers. And to us, that looks like creating systems that automate rights and royalties that can automate and create dynamic licensing. So you're not stuck in this one license, you know, it can flex or mold or shift pricing based on the usage of it. And to start for us was the artist and their digital identity and their content. Now, how do we digitize those in a way where no matter where they are on the web, we can find out you know, what the policies are around usage. We can find out you know, who wrote the song, who's involved in the song. And if we buy that license or you know, utilize that content in some way, we want to make sure everyone who had a part in that song is being paid fairly. And you know, fairly means that they can see who licensed it or at least what it was licensed for. And they can see you know, what the percentage was. And they don't see that in a year or two. They see that instantly or you know, within 15 seconds. Let's talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts mechanics of the technology itself. It comes down to, you know, I think three, three main things, right? And that's the ability to have payments, to have data, and to have identity mm. all wrapped up in a transferable way. If you're a musician or just a you know, consumer, it's, it's something you should be paying attention to. So the music space was really a natural next step for the industry to go in a lot of ways. Another um, very dysfunctional industry, right? Well, now. also, I, I feel like if the accounting firm is kind of like the epitome of the big, boring, buttoned-up corporation, then the music industry is rock and roll. And mm. it's, it's, it's a really easy way for um, an entirely different group of people to get interested in blockchain and the potential benefits that it can bring. Right. Specifically, uh, Ujo is, is reimagining the, the ways that musicians are compensated and perhaps more importantly, the way that appreciators of music express that appreciation um, by, by, by removing the middle businessmen that separate um, the appreciation of music from the selling and the creation of music. The possibilities here are, are virtually endless, right? And we're just at the very beginning of that process. Very exciting space for blockchain. We also went to Gowanus, Brooklyn, to visit Lawrence Orsini, CEO and founder of LO3 Energy, at their headquarters and workshop, where they design blockchain-based power meters for use on an electrical grid. So what is the smart grid? So historically speaking, we built from big power plants that push energy to the edge of the grid. So today, uh, people are really looking for choice. So you see a lot of distributed renewables popping up, wind, solar on people's rooftops. We now have two-way power flows. Electricity is being produced at the edge of the grid mm. as well as the head of the grid. And the grid's not really built for energy moving both directions. So smart grid has to figure out how to balance load generation, storage. And how does blockchain fit into this ecosystem that you just described? So one of the challenges is we're talking about adopting millions of devices that need to be controlled in real time. 
It's going to be billions of devices in the next few years. So what we're doing with blockchain is really sending price as a proxy for control, allowing those devices to respond in real time uh, to grid physics. So you're using blockchain as kind of a transport or communication layer inside the grid, is that right? It really is, yeah. The blockchain is really just pushing information to the edge of the grid and then picking information back up. So Lawrence, tell me what we're looking at here. So these are our transactive uh, elements. These are the actual meters uh, the blockchain runs on. So what these things do, they sit right next to your utility meter and they net the energy that's uh, going back onto the grid or that's coming off of the grid. So if you're a prosumer, that's somebody who has solar panels on your roof or a battery behind the meter, uh, then when you're producing electricity, typically you're overproducing. So you're making more energy than the house can use. So that energy actually goes back onto the grid. So that's when you're actually producing something valuable for the grid. So we want to count those electrons. So these meters uh, actually count those electrons, net what goes back on the grid, and incorporate that into the blockchain. So it's really about how do we make the edge of the grid balance itself in a smart way uh, as we get more and more distributed resources at the edge of the grid, and particularly electric vehicles. Consider this, an electric vehicle looks like two houses to the utility grid, hmm. and they drive around. Hmm. So somehow, you know, we're going to have hundreds of new houses popping up on electric grid that isn't built for it. And are these actually deployed in the field today? Yeah, we've got them deployed here. We have them in Australia. We have a few in Germany, uh, the UK. So right here in Brooklyn? Right here in Brooklyn. So I was actually on location in Brooklyn the first time they ever did a live demo of this technology. And it was thrilling to see two neighbors hmm. buying and selling energy from each other. Right. Um, on one side of the street, there was a gentleman that had good sun. And on the other side of the street, there was a gentleman who was in the shade. They were <laughs> friends. And they were transacting on the energy grid together in real time. It sounds like an economics book test case, right? I mean, it's really extraordinary. It's, it's, and they loved it. Uh, this is another example similar to Ujo where the users are empowered in a really meaningful way. It's also so interesting to see blockchain actually helping to build a new industry rather than supplanting existing technology. Finally, we came back to Manhattan to meet with Alex Rass. Before Alex got involved in blockchain, he worked in traditional finance on credit risk systems at Goldman Sachs. Now he runs his own shop that specializes in blockchain and smart contract development. What was it that you saw in this space that made you feel like this was a technology that had promise? Moving money, we've done this before. Yeah. Storing data in a database, that's been done before. Been then running code on distributed machines, all of that was done before. But now they secured it, made it solid, and distributed it in a way that has never been done before. It's very easy to scale one tiny database to go to 10 users, 100 users, 10,000 users. Been done before. But you try to say, OK, I want this piece of data to be available to the entire world. That is very tricky, and it does not work with the typical approach that's been taken so far to distributing data. So one of the things that I find very interesting about you is that you're involved in this, and you're a great advocate for the technology, but you're also profoundly skeptical of some of the things that are happening in the space. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, there's been a lot of companies, larger ones especially, who want to, who see this, they understand the value, and they say, well, we'll make our own version, but then you looked into us, and we're not going to mention to you all the problems we create by doing it in-house. So what are some of those problems? The infamous 51% attack. The way the nodes synchronize is they declare consensus that as long as majority agrees the data is right, then that's the data they, can, they maintain. So, so what you're saying is if there are more than 51% on the network that are bad actors, then suddenly the entire security of the system could be compromised. Correct, which has actually happened with public blockchains, let alone with private ones where uh, I can go to... Now, what's, major... what's that distinction between private blockchains and public blockchains? The private ones are run by a firm within the firm, and they control the nodes. They say, there's a nodes we allow, there's a nodes we don't allow. I think for many people, when they hear that, they may think, well, that, that could be less risk because there's actually a corporation that's exactly. controlling it. So I think the perception might be potentially at odds with what the reality is. Yeah, it's very common, especially with high-tech areas like math and sciences, that Things seem intuitive until somebody explains to you why they're not. 
So do you see the potential, Alex, when you look at these technologies for a catastrophic risk at some point in the future for one of these firms that is using blockchain technology? The problem is with uh, the larger, uh, the popular ones, the open source uh, blockchains, you have entire world looking for errors. Some are looking to make it better, some are looking to steal money. Whatever yeah. the case may be, there's a ton of people who are looking for problems. So what you're saying and is when these technologies are out there and they're public, they're being vetted by hundreds of thousands of people. Constantly, every day, the... all day long, because everybody wants money. And mm. Google, for in, in fact, and a lot of other firms, Microsoft even started more recently, they go out and they offer bounties to developers to go find bugs and report it to them. Um, so that only works to a certain extent. You know, the problem with the smartest guy in the room is that there's always another room. And <laughs> that, that's what happens with this kind of project, because there's so much code involved that it's really easy to miss something. So you and I go to a lot of blockchain conferences, crypto conferences, those kinds of things, and, and you listen to the speeches that you hear there. And sometimes it sounds like the only thing that's missing is the pom-poms, right? We're going to arrive <laughs> at Nirvana two weeks yes. from Tuesday. When you hear that, what is your reaction? As a technologist, I'm usually skeptical because if it was so amazing, they could have done this 10 years ago with any regular database. <laughs> okay, so now we know that blockchains organize data in blocks. And we know that blockchains can use peer-to-peer -peer networks to distribute and store data all over the world. But how does the blockchain know which nodes have accurate information? In other words, how does blockchain know what data is authentic if any node can modify the chain? What's to stop a malicious node from trying to fool the rest of the network for its own advantage? That's a problem called consensus, which is really about maintaining agreement on a network. Consensus, as it turns out, is a very old kind of challenge, which mathematicians and computer scientists call the Byzantine generals problem. What's an ancient general got to do with blockchain? Well, sending out messages between multiple parties and making sure they are valid is a problem that people have been struggling with for thousands of years. Imagine you want to send out a message to your army that says, attack at dawn, but your message is intercepted and replaced by your enemy with a counterfeit message that reads, retreat at dawn. If that happens, you've got a serious problem on your hands. On the battlefield and in finance, there are a lot of ways things can go wrong. But here's the headline. Blockchain claims to have solved the Byzantine general's problem using unique properties of high-speed computer networks and massive number crunching power. There are a number of different consensus mechanisms that blockchains can use to do this. But to give you an idea of how consensus works, here are some of the broad strokes. Participants on the blockchain use their computers to simultaneously solve very hard math problems. When one node successfully solves a math problem, a new problem is generated, and all the computers on the network switch from solving the old problem to solving the new problem. Here's the interesting part. Some consensus mechanisms use a hash, a cryptographic fingerprint of the answer to the old math problem when creating the new math problem, chaining the two problems together. Solving hard math problems takes time, but because blockchain keeps full records of all the changes that have occurred and nothing is ever thrown away, the sequence of answers combined with the times the answers were sent out to all the other nodes on the network allows the entire network to validate that the data hasn't been tampered with. We've simplified this view of blockchain. There's a lot of wonky math going on behind the scenes. But if you followed along so far, you've probably got a pretty good idea of the general way blockchain creates trust in a distributed network with no single party in charge. When we're talking about blockchains, one of the questions that often comes up is the distinction between a blockchain and a traditional database. Can you explain what exactly those differences are? Well, traditional back database, uh, you have typically you have records that you store, and the record can contain, let's say, name, phone number, and uh, address, and it goes into something called a table, and there it resides until somebody decides to erase it, update it, change it. So with the blockchain, the difference is when you come and you say, okay, I want my phone number to be one two three four five from now on, you don't erase the old record, you just append the new record after all the you know after the latest record. So anybody who reads has to read from start. But the benefit is now you don't have to store all that data. You just say, you know, phone number is being updated. At the same time, you can't say, oh, I never had that phone number because it's still stored there deep down somewhere. And anybody with the copy of the node, which should be freely distributed and available, can go dig down and find it. So why are use cases that look like plain vanilla database solutions being sold as blockchain solutions? Because of all the hype, it's become such a popular topic lately that everybody just wants to be part of it. Everybody wants to be on the bandwagon because they promised the new internet, here it is, <laughs> jump on it, or you're going to regret like you regret not jumping on it, you know, when your grandma said no. <laughs> So 
So I think Alex is actually 100% right about the, the, the question of whether or not a blockchain is really just uh, another word for a distributed database. And especially when you remove the cryptocurrency component, it really starts to look a whole lot like a distributed database. Or a distributed database with marketing upsell attached to exactly, it. Right? Exactly, exactly. And there is actually some value to be said for that. I think, you know, people weren't even talking about, they weren't even looking for use cases of distributed databases uh, before blockchain came along. And the traditional database system is perhaps no better exemplified than Equifax, the credit bureau that keeps, is, is a central repository of millions of people's credit history. Mm -hmm. The existing system, which uh, some people say might make blockchain not really as necessary as it's cracked up to be, um, was very recently powerfully hacked. Yes. In a centralized system, you would think that there's actually fewer um, points of attack. And in a distributed system, you're, you're, you're expanding the points of attack when in fact, we're seeing the exact opposite. And by moving this information to a, a, a shared distributed technology, um, you're, you're actually creating the, a disincentive for attackers to go after the, the, the honeypot, as it's called. Right. As we look back over what we watched today, what did you find most surprising? What really catches me most off guard is uh, the, the, the diversity within the enterprises themselves mm. as far as whether or not they think there's promise or it's just a bunch of hoopla. I'm really surprised that after almost 10 years, there isn't more consensus on that question. It's really a question of um, are, are, are people, are, are consumers looking to place, to, to spend their money, to express their trust um, in corporations and in centralized authorities and in protectors, or are they looking to um, uh, express their trust um, in, the, in, in, in cryptographically protected systems. And that's probably a very nuanced question, right? And how does that balance out as we move forward? Yeah, and it's, it, that, that's where there's gonna be money to be made. Um, the people who answer different parts of that question correctly first are going to make immense amounts of money. The people who um, miss subtle opportunities um, are, are gonna be left behind. And that's when we talk about the big D word, disintermediation. Right. Disintermediation is a lot of fun unless you're the one being disintermediated. Indeed. It's funny, though, to see some of these big enterprises, uh, as you put it earlier, um, self-disintermediate. Um, and, and in the end, I'm not really sure where that, that takes us, but it's going to be fascinating to watch. Thank you for joining us. It was a pleasure. Thank you.